Well, this morning we are looking again at First Peter, Peter's letter to young Christians facing challenging circumstances. I asked you a couple of weeks to help me. What can I teach on? Read the letter of First Peter, and why don't you tell me, oh man, I'd love you to touch on this. I don't understand that. And I received over 140 emails. Thank you so much. I can't cover all of those in a few weeks. I will touch on some of the uh, often repeated questions. But I do want to draw your attention and draw your resources to a few things, which will help you because I can't cover everything. Uh, Commentaries are amazing when it comes to understanding the Bible. And here's one on uh, 1 Peter by Scott McKnight. It's on the screen here. Um, Here's a brilliant commentary about understanding well what Peter's talking about and how it applies to us today. There's also the Bible Project, which um, is a go-to on everything. And so please do visit that if you haven't already. And obviously, Johnny talked about the Q&Rs coming up over the next few weeks. I'd love to sit with you and help process some things together that may have come up with in First Peter or elsewhere. But Peter, for some context, Peter is writing... Oh, I'll come back to that slide in a minute. Uh, Peter is writing to a young church that he calls in exile. There's a map on the screen here showing where Peter is. He's in Rome and he's writing to young Christians in the northern area of Turkey and they are under Roman opposition and occupation. And he's writing to them and he says very clearly, you are God's elect, your exiles scattered throughout that region. And he says, she who is in Babylon sends you greetings. So Paul's in Rome, which is called Babylon, had a nickname uh, as Babylon, writing to these Christians and saying, you are in exile. Your home is with Jesus now. He is your family, he's your God, he's your citizenship, but you're also a citizen of Asia under Roman occupation. And how does that work out? How does that play out in everyday life? Following Jesus, but also I'm a citizen under the Roman occupation of Caesar, and now Nero. And therefore, most of Paul, Peter's letter is talking about what it means to be in exile and how to behave, what we call the ethics of exile. The ethics of exile. And what we see is he particularly goes and answers the questions of the people there of how do we manage things like government when we're following Jesus, but also do I follow Caesar? How do we things like employment when my boss wants me to do something that isn't the way of Jesus? What if my spouse doesn't want to follow the way of Jesus? How do we handle these behaviors, these ethics of exile? And so this morning, I'm going to look at the first of those topics. How do we, as Christians, how do we relate to our government? How do we relate to politics? Now, it's, the irony is not um, lost on me that I'm speaking in America on Christians and politics, and I'm British. <laughs> um, July 4th coming up, and so uh, the joke is... <laughs> to take our country back means something different to maybe what you think it means. <laughs> Someone suggested to me my sermon today should be Make America Great Britain Again. <laughs> so, so the irony is not lost on me. But I am now American. And I'm a citizen of this fine country. I've lived here for 22 years. Five as a... Um, a child, and then 17 as an adult, and I, like you, are navigating the ways of Jesus in relation to government. But I'm also cognizant of this topic being highly charged. Many of you have grieved the loss of relationships over these issues. During COVID, families were torn apart over how do we follow Jesus in the context of what the government is asking us to do. People left vintage over these issues. As we said goodbye to many dear friends who were struggling with these issues. So I'm going to ask for your grace as we speak this morning. Because in any conversation that is being reduced into 35 minutes, we're going to be hitting things at 35,000 feet. 
And therefore, there's going to be nuances. There's going to be exceptions. There's going to be, well, well, how does that relate to this? And I can't cover all of those things. But I do want to recommend a book to you I think is super helpful. And that is called Compassion and Conviction by Gibney Ware and Butler. I think one of the best books on how, in America, we can engage as Christians faithfully uh, following Jesus and engaging in government and politics. I also want to give thanks to the many people I've plundered this last week in their teachings, writings, and sermons, particularly uh, Tim Keller, uh, Michael Horton, John Tyson, and others. How do we relate to government? When Jesus is our king, he's alive. He is sovereign. All authority in heaven and earth is his. He is renewing all things. He's inviting us to follow him, to renew society, to see his kingdom come. He says, when you pray, pray, your kingdom come, your will be done. And at the same time, we are being asked to follow a different authority. How does this work out in our faith, in our church? Well, Peter writes, and he gives advice to this early church community in two stages. There's three questions here on the slide, which... He poses the first two. What's the theological principle behind how we relate to authority structures in the world? Then how does this apply, particularly to the first century in government? Our job is to look at that and then go, okay, well, how does it apply to us? So let's look at this theological principle. It begins in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. This is his big idea for how Christians relate to secular authority structures. He says, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. The big idea we looked at last week is summarized in three little phrases, I put it. Beautiful submission, Kingdom difference, missional heart. I won't go into all of those three, but I did kind of summarize what Peter's saying in this big idea in kind of contemporary language. And it's on the screen here. It's as Christians, our primary posture is is to submit to societal authority structures, even if they are deeply challenging. We submit with extraordinary Jesus-like goodness so that society might be renewed and people might be attracted to Jesus. But our primary allegiance is to Jesus, and so sometimes our submission must turn to loving resistance. This is the big idea Peter's saying to exiles like this church in the first century and like us in a context like Los Angeles. And then he applies it specifically to government. He applies it specifically to government. Now remember, this group of people were living under the Roman rule with no rights, no voting, being taxed without representation. (laughs) Without any sense of meaningful participation in government. Severely persecuted and often tortured for their faith. This is the context. They're asking this not as a theological exercise, a thought exercise they are facing a deeply oppressive government. So Peter's going, this is how this principle applies to you. And it begins in verse 13. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors, who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Let's look at this together. The first thing that Peter's saying is government is God's idea and design for us. Freedom from government is not God's design. 
Verse 13, he says, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority. And he goes on to say, we shall all have been sent by God to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. There's a good function of government in the world. It's part of God's creative design of for human flourishing. Human flourishing, Jesus style, who created all things, is not some sanctified version of Lord of the Flies where no one's in charge. That's why in Genesis 1, 28, part of the creative design for human flourishing, it says, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Authority, government, is woven into the fabric of creation. We are to govern things in order to bring beauty and goodness and human flourishing out of the chaos. It's why we thrive under the authority of King Jesus. Finding our best selves is not throwing off authority, but finding the right authority. And through the authority of Jesus, he delegates and sets up systems of government both in secular culture and in the church, so that we can thrive under the benevolence of authority. Government has an important role in society to bring order, to bring justice, to bring safety, to provide the environments for prosperity. But Peter goes on to say, number two, he says, God calls us to submit to government. Verse 15, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor, etc., etc. Now, this is a radical new idea for the people of God. This is a radical new idea. See, under the old covenant, God had covenanted with a people, the nation of Israel, that through that nation, that ethnically bound nation, his kingdom would come. It was a theocracy that this nation had their own ruler going back to the kings of Israel. And therefore, the disciples expected Jesus to come and to bring his kingdom into the world by setting up a new theocracy, by going to Rome, overthrowing Caesar and allowing the people of God to rule themselves. But Jesus didn't do this. In fact, he inaugurated a new kingdom in continuity to the past. But this covenant was in fulfillment of the promise that through Abraham, the old covenant, all nations will be blessed. Seen in the great fulfillment at Pentecost where the Spirit is birthed through multiple languages that now the covenant is no longer with an ethnic people but all people who follow Jesus. We are a covenant people, not a covenant nation. That's why just before this, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, Peter writes to this Gentile community who are now Christians. He says, but you are a chosen people. You are now the royal priest of the holy nation, God's special possession. Together as the people of God who follow Jesus, we are now the people of God. There once was a nation of God, but now there are people of God in every nation. There are now Christians in every nation. There is not to be a Christian nation. The kingdom of God comes through his church, wherever they are found. Not by setting up a government. We see this in Jesus himself. He submits to the government. He does not seek to overthrow and when it comes to even his death, he submits to the authority of Pilate. Professor Michael Horton writes this. When Jesus Christ arrived, he did not revive the Sinai theocracy as his contemporaries had hoped. Instead of driving out the Romans, he commanded love for the enemies, love for our enemies. Gathering the new Israel, Jew and Gentile, around himself by his spirit, through word and sacrament, Jesus inaugurated the kingdom of grace that will be manifested one day as a kingdom of glory. 
through, so this is how the kingdom comes, not through government or legislation, but now his kingdom comes through its administration of gospel preaching, baptism, the Lord's Supper, prayer, and discipline. The church is God's new society inserted into the heart of the secular city as a witness to Christ and the age to come when he will be all in all. The primary task, therefore, of Christians to follow Jesus in renewing all things, to seeing his kingdom come, to see injustice driven out. Our primary posture is discipleship, not dominion. It's not coercive power and obedience. It's grace and love and transformation. The only discipleship can change the human heart. Jesus is going beyond legislation to actually transformation of the human heart. Transformed people transform societies. We see this with simply the story of Jesus and Zacchaeus. Here is one of the great traitors of the Jewish people. He's a tax collector on behalf of the Roman occupation. He's hiding up up in a tree, listening to the teaching of Jesus. And through this incredible interaction with Jesus, he becomes a follower of Jesus. And something happens on the inside of him that turns him from greed and fleecing the people of God to actually generosity and blessing the people of God. It wasn't through a ruling of the legislation. It was through the grace of Jesus Christ. John Tyson writes, or spoke, he says, in our cultural moment, an idealized American past is making a claim that we should take it back for God. We should resist this with humility and get on with the business of making disciples of Jesus. Discipleship transforms nations, not coercion. Number three, Peter says, God's call, God calls us to redemptive participation with our government. In verse 15, Peter writes, it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. So on the one hand, he's saying, we are not to seek the kingdom of Jesus by coercive power, but nor are we to slip into passivity. Neither power nor passivity, but participation with Jesus in seeing all things renewed. The church has been complicit in evil at times in history by seizing power. The church has also been complicit in evil by being passive when evil is rampant. But Jesus invites us to seek his kingdom, to join him in seeing the renewal of all things by redemptive participation. Seeing his kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven by by participating within the structures of our society. It's why when Jeremiah prophesied to the people of God in in exile in 6th century BC in Babylon, the word of the Lord said, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I've carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it. For it prospers, you too will prosper. We are to be salt and light We are to be an influence in society that raises the tide for all boats, that we see his kingdom come, his will be done, not by overthrowing, but by redemptive participation. See, Jesus has called us as his church to drive back injustice, poverty, racism, greed, individualism, consumerism, that we are to give birth in the name of Jesus to justice, healing, dignity, renewal. But we do this not by coercion, but by redemptive participation. That includes non-governmental participation and governmental participation. Tim Keller writes, the Bible shows believers as holding important posts in pagan governments. Think of Joseph and Daniel in the Old Testament. Christians should be involved politically as a way of loving our neighbors, whether they believe as we do or not to work for better schools or for a justice system not weighted against the poor or to end racial segregation requires political engagement. Christians have done these things in the past and should continue to do so. Christians actually have a unique contribution to the sphere of government. John Tyson puts these five uniquenesses of the Christian in government, a vision for human dignity rooted in an unshakable 
theology of everyone made in the image of God, a concern for poor and the vulnerable, echoing the teachings of Jesus, a suspicion of human nature that we know checks and balances are needed because sin is rampant in every human heart, a responsibility for the other that we are actually to love our neighbor as ourselves and not just look after ourselves, and of course the favor of God that we believe as we follow the ways of God, then his favor follows. History is filled with amazing examples, therefore, of Christians following the way of Jesus, following the work of Jesus by engaging politically. I'm reminded this week, as I prepared the sermon, of the famous example of what is called the Clapham sect, sect in the old way of the word just meaning group. In 18th century England, men and women lived in a certain part of southwest London, were listening to the teaching of their local pastor, and they thought, we need to do something about it. We need to actually see our faith turn into practical goodness in our society. So this group of men and women who were authors, lawyers, businessmen and women, um, and members of government got together and decided, how can we join with Jesus in seeing the renewal of our country? Famously, they led the charge in the success for the abolition of the slave trade. Most notably, through one of their primary leaders, William Wilberforce. But they had actually over 70 different causes. Set up 70 different societies and charities and went through government to try and see the healing of the nation in a very dark time. Through their Christian faith, They launched initiatives and societies for the reform of the penal system, the abolition of cruel sports, the restriction on excessive gambling, small debt relief, improvements in the care of the mentally ill, protection of orphan girls, the improvement of factory conditions for the poor, protection of refugees, the abolition of climbing boys who were the chimney sweeps, which was a horrendous trade where these small chimneys, only small boys as young as six, were sold into the chimney business to climb up the pipes, often hot and searing, to clean them out, and often would get stuck and suffocate and die. Cast a different shade on Mary Poppins, doesn't it? Um, I love, actually, it's so Victorian England, because the, the, the wording of these societies and legislations going through Parliament had to be very proper and prim. They couldn't use like the, like the gross words that they were actually trying to, um, the evil words that represented the evil behind them. So for example, they were, had a, a wonderful society and legislation against sex trafficking. Um, and, but here's what they had to call it uh, on the screen. The Society for Returning Young Women to Their Friends in the Country. <laughs> So Victorian. They're, they're actually, their, their compassion and their need to care for widows and orphans, as to the teaching of Jesus, they said, we need to do something about this. And so they did it, but they called it this. They said, it's the Society for the Friendly Female Society for the Relief of Poor, Infirm, Aged Widows and Single Women of Good Character who have seen better days. <laughs> That's brilliant. In other words, let's care for widows and orphans. We are to be actively engaged, to join with Jesus in seeing his goodness, his justice, his equality, drive out evil in our society. Peter, if he was writing to us today, would say one of the primary ways you can do good is actually to engage in the voting system. You can vote. You can participate. That was unheard of in their day. What a privilege that we have today. And many people have asked me, well, Gay, how do we vote as Christians? This is a complex, and America is a unique environment for this question. And I'm not going to tell you who to vote for at all. And in fact, I've faced the complexity of that question like I've never faced it in every, any other country I've lived in. And so with all the different things you have to take into account, with all the different things, I do want to actually throw his one ingredient that was helpful for me in in prayerfully considering my vote. And it was an article in the New York Times written by the late Tim Keller, which I found is very short but poignant, called How Do Christians Fit into the Two-Party System? They Don't. (laughs) 
the historical Christian positions on social issues don't match up with contemporary political alignments. I'm going to quote a lot from this, argue, uh, from this article, if that's okay. He begins by saying, the historic Christian positions on social issues um, don't match up with contemporary political arguments. Then he goes, while believers can register under a party affiliation and be active in politics, they should not identify the Christian church or faith with, with a political party as the only Christian one. There are a number of reasons for this. And he lists a number of reasons. I'm just going to talk about two. One of the reasons he says political affiliation and political parties are often about wisdom, not biblical commands. So he says this. Most political positions are not matters of biblical command, but of practical wisdom. Then he goes on to give an illustration. The biblical commands to lift up the poor and to defend the rights of the oppressed are moral imperatives for believers. For individual Christians to speak out against egregious violations of these moral requirements is not optional. However, there are many possible ways to help the poor. Should we shrink government and let private capital markets allocate resources? Or should we expand the government and give the state more of the power to redistribute wealth? Or is the right path one of the many possibilities in between? The Bible does not give exact answers to these questions for every time, place, and culture. The Christian is for Jesus. And together we have to work out in our time, in our place, in our context, how do we actually best serve the ways of Jesus in our context? The second reason not to affiliate Christianity with any one political party is what he calls package deal ethics. He says another reason Christians these days cannot allow the church to be fully identified with any particular party is the problem of package deal ethics. Increasingly, political parties insist that you cannot work on one issue with them if you don't embrace all of their approved positions. This emphasis on package deal puts pressure on Christians in politics. For example, following both the Bible and the early church, Christians should be committed to racial justice and the poor, but also to the understanding that sex is only for marriage and for nurturing family. One of those views seems liberal, and the other looks um, oppressively conservative. The historical Christian positions on social issues do not fit into contemporary political alignments. Just some food for thought. <laughs> there, there are many other ingredients. Before you email me, I know there are many other ingredients that go into how we vote. But I think this is key to say as well. Which to be a Christian is not to be a member of any particular party. That could be how you believe it's best to outwork the ethics of Jesus in this time and place. But that is not a biblical stance to say they are necessarily connected. Number four, God calls us to loving resistance. Verse 16, live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Peter says, you are free from being a slave to government. You can say to Caesar, you do not own me, because you are owned now by God. You have come under the gracious rule of King Jesus, and he is your authority. You are free from being enslaved to government. But, he says, a primary way of demonstrating that you now are fully obeying your God is that you follow his commands to submit to your government. You know you're a disciple of God when you submit to your government. Because that is the command of your God. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. To throw off government, to reject societal structures, is not the way of Jesus. It's what Jesus says in Matthew 22. So give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. 
We are to submit to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. Out of obedience to God. But the implication here also is if our ultimate allegiance is to God, then at times our submission must turn to loving resistance. Where we say to our ruling authorities, out of honor, I hear you, out of respect, I've understood where you're coming from, but out of my obedience to Jesus, I cannot do what you're asking me to do. When do we do this? Peter implies the bar is really high before we do this. I mean really high. Think of Peter writing to a church in gross oppression. Gross taxation without representation. No votes, no rights. And yet in that context, his primary posture to them is submit to your government. Same for Paul in Romans 13. They don't lay out the exact um, circumstances. It would be impossible to do so. That book would be a million pages long. If this, then that. If this, then that. But the bar is certainly high. And the examples of Scripture where civil disobedience does occur seems to imply the general principle that we draw the line when the government commands something God forbids or forbids what God commands. That where there is a fundamental, fundamental split between what my government is asking and what is a primary and foundational aspect of what it means to follow Jesus. Clear-cut examples are therefore in Acts 4 when the disciples are told, you must not teach the name of Jesus. And they said, I'm sorry, man, we want to submit to government, but you've, we've got to hold the line at that. where governments have said to Christians, you should not and cannot meet to try and squash this movement of Christians. Totalitarian governments have often said, we refuse you to be able to meet. This is not whether we meet digitally or in person during COVID-19. This is, you are not allowed to meet. We are trying to squash you as a church. And yet the church has thrived as an underground church, refusing to follow the ways of a totalitarian regime and to meet underground in civil disobedience. Or whether it be to submit to a different moral ethic, that God's design for dignity and equality for all, no matter of the color of your skin, where we are celebrating the civil rights movement of standing up and saying we believe in the human dignity of all individuals and all are equal under, under the creation of God. Or whether it be standing up for the unborn where life begins in the womb. Or whether it be saying we have to stand with the, mor- the morality of the created design of Jesus as God's design for sex and marriage. All of these are foundational areas of we follow Jesus. It means there's going to be areas which are not so fundamental or clear-cut where the church has wrestled over centuries. Do we submit or do we not here? Again, the implication is the bar's got to be quite high. It can't just be that you don't believe in the taxation system. (laughs) Or taxes are being spent on something that you don't think they should be spent on. We had COVID conversations and disagreements and it's okay to disagree with love around these issues. These are very difficult. We had many, many conversations during COVID on the the advice and the recommendation and the, the government saying, do not meet in person, meet online and in other ways. And yet there were some churches, well, all of us gathered together and went, is this something we actually disobey? We need to do so thoughtfully theologically, in a very nuanced way, because our primary posture must always to be good citizens to obey, even if we suffer.
Just as important as when is how. Peter goes out of his way to talk about even when you do these things, you need to honor the emperor, respect your authorities. While civil disobedience may be required in extreme circumstances, we have to go out of our way to show that we are doing this with great humility, love for enemy, respect for all, because even our enemies are made in the image of God. We ought to pray for those who oppose us, bless those who persecute us. And even in our redemptive participation, as Dr. Martin Luther, Luther King Jr. said, hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. It seems in our contemporary culture that Christians are more concerned about what we're standing up for than how we're standing up for it. And we're giving people a pass on how they behave as long as they're standing up for something we agree with. That is not the way of Jesus. Peter says both are equally important. So in conclusion, I want to say what a privilege it is to live in America and not in the Roman Empire. We have it really good. We have it really good. I know there's a common fear, oh, it's so terrible. Nothing compared to what it was like under the Roman occupation. We have a vote. We have ways of participation. We are allowed to protest, to gather, to march, to get involved in government. We have significant opportunities to be a redemptive influence in our culture, in our society. And I want to end with one word for all of us, I think, as we enter into this election cycle. It's what Peter says in verse 17. Show proper respect to everyone, even to those you don't agree with who stand for a political stance you don't agree with. Respect. Everyone is made in the image of God. Love the family of believers. Fear God and honor the emperor. I wanted to focus in on fear God. We are to fear God, not what's happening in our society. Fear, to fear God, is actually a good thing. It's not to be afraid of. The word here, to fear God, is to be at peace because you know he's in control and he is sovereign. That whatever happens down here, his plans are never thwarted. Therefore, we do not vote, we do not participate, we do not worship, we do not talk, we do not tweet, we do not post out of fear of any direction in which our country is going in. Because we know the outcome. And his kingdom will have no end. We know who is the supreme being. And his name is Jesus. We know... We know... That society can be terrible like under the times of Rome, but Rome's come and go. Yeah. Yeah. But the kingdom of Jesus will never fail. Amen. I love America with all of its warts, with all of its goodness, and I seek its peace and its health and its healing. But our hope is not in the American government but in Jesus. Our hope and foundation is not on any particular political party, but in King Jesus. And our peace is not in legislation, but the transformation of the human heart that can only happen through the grace and gospel of King Jesus. Where is your hope? Where is your peace? Let's stand together.